This week we've been talking on various themes of going and seeking the ancient paths. We talked about in principle that that's what God expects of us who are on the wrong path, is going back to the right path. And we looked at this principle applied in different ways. Uh, really we looked at again, Sunday morning, Jeremiah 6.16, going back to those ancient paths. And the next hour we looked at what should be our attitude when it comes to the Word of God. And that's best exemplified by what the children of Israel said in Exodus 19 and 24. All that the Lord says we will do. We looked at how that requires humility and honesty on our part. And we have to be honest with the text. Uh, when I first started preaching at Country Club Road, uh, it was a two-man setup. Uh, the, the, the older man was, had been preaching there for 39 years. I was brought on to bring new life into the congregation, and that only lasts about three months because he had to move away and take care of his parents, which we all understand those things have to happen. But I, I tell you that because when I was teaching through Galatians there, I, oftentimes this older man would get a phone call from me, and I wouldn't even say hi on the phone. I would say, Hugh, why do I have to be honest with the text? It would be so much easier if I just regurgitated everything I've been told. It says because we have to be honest with what God tells us. And again, I said that tongue in cheek. No, but it's because I was wrestling with something. Now, how do I, how am I, how do I work through this? How do I be honest? How do I obey? How do I follow what God would want me to do? That's the type of attitude. That's the type of wrestling we need to have with the text. That no matter how much we have to work through, it's worth working through it to get to truth. And that's a process. And that process is exemplified by the attitude of whatever the Lord says for me to do, that I will do. We also looked Sunday evening of just general principles. How do you figure out what God wants? We looked at you and how communication works. You know, communication works really one of three ways. I can directly tell you something. I can show you something. Or I can, hope, I can imply something and hopefully you get the hint. Now, in the scriptures, we would say that's a necessary inference. That is, it's something that, um, it's something that of necessity, that conclusion is the only thing you can draw from that. So, for example, we looked at Hebrews 10.25, not neglecting our own assembling together as is the habit of some. If there is an assembling together of necessity, it means there's a place to assemble. Um, and Monday night, we looked at what, did the Bible, what does the Bible have to say about the church? We looked a lot about the nature of the church, how it belongs to Christ. Christ sets, is the final authority over the church. And if we can't find our church in the Bible, if we can't find book, chapter, and verse, the authority for what our church is doing, what we're teaching, what we're practicing, well, if it's not in the book, we don't, we don't want to be a part of that. Uh, we don't want to go by the I think so's of men. We want to go by book, chapter, and verse. The very first sermon I preached at the work I'm at now, was a sermon called What You Can Expect. And I made that point. That what they could expect from me was I'm not going to say, well, I think this is this, or in my opinion, this is how it should be. And everything I teach, I am endeavoring to stick with the book. And the few times I say, now, I'll give a, f I'll give a little warning or asterisk when I said, now, this is just me thinking out loud here based on you know, making some inferences from the text, but I'm very quick to go back to that being said, here's what the text actually says. There's times where you sometimes are you're trying to put yourself in the mind of the Bible character. We're going to be doing that tonight with Nicodemus in John 3. What must it have been like for Nicodemus to come to Jesus by night? You know, what, what questions did he have? What was he wondering? What, was it scary for him? Was it intimidating to go against the wishes of the Sanhedrin to come to this, what they viewed as a false teacher, to start asking these questions? That's speculatory. But it's helpful at times to sometimes get ourselves in the same place that the, that the people in the Bible were at. We might think of ourselves as trying to picture ourselves get ready to receive the covenant that the children, that the children of Israel did in Exodus 19. What must have been going through our minds at that point? So tonight we're going to be looking at John chapter 3. You must be born again. This is a chapter that has, well, the... Probably the most well-known verse in the Bible, uh, John 3.16, which we will cover tonight. We won't be in the entirety of the chapter. We're really looking up <laughs> until verse 16. But we're going to go through some things tonight, and 
I pray that you all will listen to these with open, open hearts and open minds to consider what this text says. As I have done my due diligence to stick with the text, to see how the Bible uses certain language and, and imagery, to, to see what Jesus is really teaching here. And what, is, what do we find elsewhere in the text that uses the same language to identify what is that, that new birth? What is, does it mean to be born again? So when we begin here, in John, the third chapter, we're going to be starting looking at verses 1 through 16, maybe even 21 or so. We start off with a ruler of the Jews by the name of Nicodemus. Looking here in the uh, first two verses. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Now, we're just going to stop right there. We need to talk a little bit about who this man is. Now, John chapter 3 actually starts in the middle of a thought. You know, the the chapter and verse divisions were added into our Bibles later by men. Uh, Most of the time, they get it right. It's a handy aid to find verses quickly. But sometimes they break up the thought of the text. The thought we were jumping in the middle of began in chapter 2 and verse 23. Uh, If you want to read 23 through 25 here. Now, this has happened when Jesus is in Jerusalem. It says, Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, during the feast, many believed in his name, observing his signs which he was doing. But Jesus on his part was not entrusting himself to them, for he knew all men. And because he did not need anyone to testify concerning man, for he himself knew what was in man. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night. And we read the rest of the text there. Nicodemus, as we begin chapter 3, is being contrasted with the people that, were, that we read at the end of chapter 2. Here are people at the temple who are, we might say, caught up in religious fervor or not entirely sincere. They're people who Jesus is not willing to entrust himself to yet. This might be the same people that we read about later in the Gospel of John who wanted to make Jesus a king, hence why Jesus fled and, and hid away for a time being why, to get away from those people, because it was not yet time. But Nicodemus, we're supposed to see that there's something different about Nicodemus. It's, he's, more, he's not just interested in the fact that he can just do some miracles. He's not just interested in, like, well, here's a new teacher that's shown up. I'm, like, I'm, I'm kind of interested. Nicodemus is going out of his way during what many rabbis considered the prime study time of the day at night where it was all quiet and you had all the distractions of the world were, were away. Nicodemus is giving up his evening. Nicodemus is going with the possible threat of him being chastised by his other members of the Sanhedrin because this Jesus is not to be talked to. This Jesus is not to be associated with. This man is different from others because his belief in Jesus is more than just skin deep. And what do we know about Nicodemus? Well, the text tells us he's the ruler of the Jews. I've hinted at this before, but more likely it means he was a member of the Sanhedrin. He was some person of authority. The Sanhedrin was the council of 70 elders of the Jews who, in theory, had authority over all Jews worldwide. In practice, it really was the Jews in Palestine. Um, But that didn't mean they weren't powerful. These men are the ones who we read in John 8, who brings a woman caught in adultery before them, and they have the power of life or death over her. Uh, these are the ones who will vote to put Jesus to death. They have some authority. And Nicodemus is one of them. But he's an open-minded man. Again, John begins very early, but very early in Jesus' ministry, we find out that the Sanhedrin, the ruling Jews, do not like this man. They don't like that he's teaching the law to the people, that he's challenging the preconceived ideas. He's challenging the traditions of the elders. But we don't see Nicodemus getting caught up in this. He's open-minded. We we can conclude that, but he didn't outright reject Jesus. Of the rulers, he could have just said this, Jesus is just like, like Judas and the others who have risen up before him. He's another crazy religious teacher. He's, he's, eh, I don't need to listen to him. Now, Nicodemus comes and investigates for himself. He observed his works, and we see in verse 2, he, concludes, he makes a right conclusion. 
No one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Again, later on in Jesus' ministry, the Sanhedrin, some of the ruling Jews will say, well, Jesus, yeah, he does these miracles, but it's by the power of Satan. It's not by God. It's by Beelzebub. Um, but not Nicodemus. Not Nicodemus. This conclusion led them to come to Jesus by night, verse 2 again. Now, some of it suggested that this might have indicated fear or caution on behalf of Nicodemus. Perhaps he was fearing the Pharisees would have thrown him out of the synagogue, maybe fearing what they might think of him. And it would be understandable because if you turn to John chapter 12, we see this was the very thing that did happen with many of the rulers of the Jews. In John 12, verses 42 and 43, <clears throat> 42 and 43 of John 12, it says, Nevertheless, many even of the rulers believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they were not confessing him for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the approval of man rather than the approval of God. Now, John gives us the reason why this particular group was not confessing their belief in Jesus. But I would say to you that if the rulers had such fear, it would not be uncommon for the common person to have such fear. Again, these rulers of the Jews had that authority to throw you out of the synagogue. Which, in the first century rule, this doesn't mean that, well, you can't show up here anymore. Your, your membership's been revoked. This would be to cu be cut off completely from any support or safety net in the ancient world because there is no medicare medicaid there's no social security there's no food stamps if you were on hard times if you were needing help you were dependent upon the people in your community um you know maybe to try and convey the point a little bit more it'd be like pretend we're a first century synagogue um I'm going to see if I can remember your guys' professions correctly. So if I get it wrong, tell me afterwards. But it'd be like, say I'm fearful uh, uh, that I, I will get put out of the synagogue. Now, if that happens, well, my phone account is with Brandon at AT&T. That's gone. Um, let's say Bob and Gloria sold produce to, uh, from the restaurant. Well, I can't shop at that market anymore because they've withdrawn from me. Um, I can't do anything. All the resources I had are gone now because of the social obligations of what this meant. So we can understand there's some fear here. There's some very big fear. Now we talked about, unless it's a church, that's why there's such a big emphasis on hospitality and taking care of the needs of the brethren in the New Testament. Because people were put out of the synagogue when they confessed their faith in Jesus. And the church had an obligation of, since you are now part of this new community, we are going to take care of you. So we can see what's on the line with Nicodemus. If this goes too far, he could lose everything. That doesn't stop him. And another reason to consider, Barclay notes that, quote, the rabbis had declared at this time the best time to study the law was at the night when a man was undisturbed. You know, throughout the day, Jesus was surrounded by crowds of people all the time. It may be that Nicodemus came to Jesus by night because he wanted absolute private and completely undisturbed time with Jesus to ask his questions. So, we get to the text. He says to Jesus, again, as we read, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs unless... God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he's old? He cannot enter a second time in his mother's womb and be born, can he? Now before we get to Jesus' answer, we want to look at some of this stuff here. Um, he knew that Jesus was a teacher sent from God. But Nicodemus didn't confess anything beyond that. We see early on in the disciples following Jesus that they had some understanding that he was a teacher sent from God. But Peter's the first one that declares publicly, you're not just a teacher. You're the son of God. You're the Christ. You're the one we've been waiting for. Nicodemus, he has seen enough to conclude that, yeah, you're a teacher like Moses, one of the prophets. 
You know, they worked attesting miracles. Elijah, Elijah rained fire down upon the false prophets of Baal. Moses had his miracles to show that God was with him. Jesus worked some miracles. Okay, so that means God must be revealing something new right now. But that's where it stops. So Jesus' statement here in verse 3 is meant to shatter that. Meant to help Nicodemus look beyond that. I'm more than just a teacher. Now, Jesus could outright have said, hey, I'm the son of God. As we talked about on how we establish biblical authority, God respects our intelligence. And a lesson that we have learned on our own is much more valuable than perhaps what somebody else told us. Case in point, my dad told me all the years growing up since I had my driver's license, it is dangerous and dumb to drive on icy roads. Now, you all, that's different. They treat the roads up here. In Oregon, because they're afraid of the beautiful sidelines and the roads that have all the roadkill of getting it nasty and ugly, they don't salt the roads. They use this chemical treatment that washes off after the first rainfall and it, it doesn't stay on the roads. And no one knows how to drive in snow because we get snow once every eight years. I tell you this because my dad grew up all, you know, I saw snow maybe five times big in Oregon growing up. Don't drive in it. I'm not so much worried about you, but it's everyone else who doesn't know how to drive on it. He told me that lesson tons of times. What did I do when college classes started on Monday and I need to be back in Portland on Sunday? I drove on half-inch sheet of ice on the roads in a Chevy Cavalier with balding tires. And I lived, clearly. But I think I took a few years off my life from the stress I was under. He had told me that lesson for years. Now that I had the experience to say, uh-uh, you can't pay me enough. The few times that snows in Tucson, I just, I'm happy to sit inside. I'm like, nope, you're not going to pay me enough to go out there in it. I like the snow. I like to visit it. I'm not going to drive in it. Hence why God does the same thing with us. He could outright tell us everything. But the lesson is much more valuable and sticks with us more when we get it on our own. So he's helping Nicodemus here. Help him get beyond that I'm more than just a teacher. So let's note a few things about what Jesus said here that would challenge his idea, that this, this would blow his mind at this radical new idea. So he says, unless one. Doesn't specify a specific group of people, a specific lineage. It's anyone. Which indicates that this new birth is an essential requirement to enter the kingdom of God for all people. Now, Nicodemus comes from a tradition where I'm a child of Abraham. I'm in the lineage. I'm in the family. I'm born into it. You know, Jesus, early on in his ministry, um, talks, about those, uh, talks about the effects of sin and being in slavery. He says that some of the rulers says, we've never been enslaved. We're children of Abraham. And Jesus tells elsewhere, he says, that doesn't mean anything. I'm paraphrasing, of course. It doesn't mean anything. I can raise up children from Abraham from this rock. Your lineage doesn't matter when it comes to the new kingdom that's coming, the kingdom of God. So that would have challenged Nicodemus. That, wait, anyone who was born again? It also tells us born again. So this is to be born anew, to be born anew and from above. I, be I believe both are meant here by Christ. That in order to enter the kingdom of God, one has to have this new birth. And wants to begin life anew in reference to the relationship with God. And this can only come from God himself. This, this cannot happen by our own will, our own do-gooding, our own righteousness. It has to come from God. You know, you think about the concept of birth in general. None of us chose, okay? None of us had a part in our own birth. It was doctors and our mothers, mainly our mothers. They're doing all the work. Likewise, the new birth, it is a passive thing for us. We're not doing the work. God is doing all the work. And that will become more clear in a few moments. And the final thing was, to, he cannot see the kingdom of God unless he does this. To see me here means participate in. So the new birth is absolutely essential to enter the, the kingdom of God. Which again, in of itself, been challenging to Nicodemus because he already thought he was in the kingdom of God. Oh, we're, the, we're the Jews. We're the Israelites. We're already there. And Jesus says, no, you're not. 
We need to look beyond this. You need to look beyond what you're seeing here in the moment. Now, Nicodemus, again, we have to put ourselves in his shoes. We have the benefit of living on this side of the cross. We have the whole revelation of God. We, some of us have heard this stuff for years and decades. Nicodemus is hearing this for the first time. And you can be, and maybe this is a better way to describe this, but I'm not thinking of a better way right now. There's, you can be dumb smart. You can be brilliant in one category, and you could be lacking all knowledge in that category. Um, you know, I, the, the example, uh, uh, take me. You know, I like to think I'm pretty competent in history. That's what my degree is in. I like, I, I like to think, like to think, I know how to handle the scriptures fairly well. Uh, you try and get me to troubleshoot anything beyond basic computer problems, and I may as well be a complete Luddite who's from the Stone Age and never seen a piece of technology in my life. I just, it's foreign to me. I bring this up because Nicodemus could have been very smart in the traditions and the Talmud and all that stuff of the Jews. But he's going to ask a very basic question here. He's going he's gonna to think too literally here. He's going to go, verse 4. How can, how can somebody who's already born be born again? I, I'm just picturing Nicodemus here sitting there and trying to figure out in his mind just how does, how does that work? That's what he's asking Jesus. How does that work? He can't think of any other birth possible except physical. Hence why Jesus answers him in verse 5. Don't worry. It looks like a lot. It's not, it's not going to be a lot. Jesus answered, verse 5. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of, the, of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes from and where it goes, or is going. So is everyone who is born of the spirit. Now pausing right here. To be born of the water and spirit is to, is to experience the radical life-changing uh, transform the power of God in conversion. We, we've already talked on some level of this previously. You know, God repeatedly through his calls to repentance in the Old Testament likens that if the children of Israel would just repent and obey and go back to what they were doing, he, God would bring times of refreshing. He would heal them. He would cleanse their iniquities. All this language of cleansing, of purity, of new life, all that's there. Case in point, if you look at Ezekiel chapter 36, you know, this type of language is not new. For somebody skilled in the law, or hopefully skilled in the law, there should have been some parallels drawn here. Ezekiel chapter 36, looking at verse 25, and we'll read through verse 27. Now, Ezekiel is one of the major prophets, like most of the major prophets, if not all the major prophets. It's a, it's a prophecy of judgment. Israel and Judah have, have sinned greatly. They have engaged and they have worshipped the Baals. They have engaged in gross immorality and child sacrifice. It's a mess. But even when God is delivering the fiercest of judgments, there is always a glimmer of hope at the future. That this punishment is not for the sake of God feels like, oh, I just feel like being mean today. The punishment has, there's two reasons for it. One, it's because God is a God of justice and wickedness cannot be left unanswered and unpunished. That's the primary reason. Secondly, God is trying to achieve something and is achieving something through his people Israel. This judgment is also a chastising for their growth. Because, and this is a whole other lesson, but you look in Galatians chapter 3, I encourage you to read that. God is using Israel to bring about the Christ, which Jesus is. So Jesus would know a thing or two about this language. But in order to bring about the Christ, he gives them glimmers of hope. Why is this happening? Why is this chastening happening? Verse 25. So he's, he's talking about Israel is going to be renewed for his name's sake. 
God says to him, then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. So there's an idea of newness there. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I'll remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. So you have this idea of, of, of a cleansing. There is a washing and there is the spirit is involved as well. This, this language, and we could talk a lot about this, but I bring this up because this language should not have been unfamiliar to somebody who was skilled in the law. This language is not unfamiliar to the people of God in the Old Testament of this, this cleansing, this newness, this new birth. But God used that to convey the same ideal to Israel, this renewing. But Jesus here in John 3 is not calling Israel to repentance, but all people to repentance. Um, the new birth is necessary for all peoples who wish to enter the kingdom of God. Now the question for us is, okay, what do we find in the Bible that combines the spirit and the water? Uh, you see in John 3, again, he, he makes that statement. Unless one is born of the water and of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God, or he cannot see the kingdom of God. Both are said. Uh, John 3, 3 and John 3, 5. So we need to look in the Bible, what is there that combines both the spirit and the water? Now, what I have found is Titus chapter 3 and verse 5. There in Titus 3 and verse 5, speaking about the blessings of redemption and salvation, Paul writes to Titus, a Christian, speaking of God, he saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. So there's a washing here. There's a cleansing. What do you wash with? You wash with water. And the spirit is involved. Here we have both the water and the spirit. Elsewhere in the scriptures, this event, this washing, is referred to as um, the event in a person's life that takes him from sinner to saint. For example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 11. So it says here, now he's just gotten done then, verses 7, uh, excuse me, verses 9 and 10 of reminding everyone of the list of people who will not enter the kingdom of God. That's a lot of sins there. Stuff that we've all probably, if we're honest, have been involved in. But he says in verse 11, such were some of you. Why were they able to say they were that? What happened in their lives? You were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Spirit of our God. Again, you have this washing and you have the Spirit. Both are involved here. Now, what else is in the letter? What else is in the Bible that speaks of a washing? Now, we talked about this a little bit earlier in the week, but if you look in Acts chapter 22 and verse 16, I bring this up because the Apostle Paul is consistent with the language he uses. Now, the Apostle Paul is the one who writes 1 Corinthians. He is also the one who writes Titus. In fact, he writes most of the New Testament. And Acts, although written by the disciple Luke, Luke is an eyewitness to Paul's testimony before Felix. If anything you can think about Acts 22 is Luke being a courtroom stenographer of recording exactly what Paul was saying here. And you see in verse 16, when Paul recounts his conversion, that Ananias had come to him. He says in verse 16, Now why do you delay? Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. There's that washing again. There's that cleansing again. It's this, it's in baptism, that Paul tells us in Romans chapter 6 that we become united with him in his death, in his burial, and resurrection. And the same power that raised Jesus from the grave is the same power that gives us new life. We read that in Titus chapter 3 and verse 5. The Spirit, God, is the one who gives the new birth. The Spirit descends upon us to give life to our sin, sick, and dead souls. 
And so when we raise up out of that watery grave, we walk in newness of life. Hence why Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. Time out. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. Where does that newness come from? I know it's not on the screen, but since I referenced Romans chapter 6, let's go there. Uh, Romans chapter 6. Now, Romans chapter 6 comes at a zenith in the book of Romans. The first five chapters, first chapters 1 through 3, Paul makes the case that everyone is guilty before the law of God. The lawful person, the unlawful person, the Jew and the non-Jew, no one is, has an excuse before God. There's a solution, though. Justification by faith in Romans chapter 4 and 5. 5 shows us the results of this. But how does that justification, when does that justification take place? So if we, and that's in Romans 6. So like I said, we're going to tie 2 Corinthians 5.17. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. Well, how did that newness come about? Verse 3 of Romans 6. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ, oh, there it is. That's how we get into Christ. Paul said it. The Bible has told us been baptized into Christ, Jesus have been baptized into his death. Therefore, because we, be, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in the newness of life. For if we become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing that our old self was crucified with him in order, our, in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who died is freed from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we should also live with him. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again, death is no longer master over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once and for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. There's this whole idea of we died to our former manner of life. That person was buried, and you're resurrected to walk in newness of life. Hence why Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, that if you're in Christ, you're a new creature. Whatever happened before, it's gone. You are now sanctified. You are now justified. In the name of the Lord Christ Jesus, you have been set apart as a, as a peculiar people, as somebody for God's own possession. Now, We've drawn on the rest of Scripture for this. Nicodemus didn't have that just yet. But Nicodemus still has some questions. We draw it on the rest of Scripture for our benefit here, but we go back to John 3. A very natural question is next, how can these things be, Nicodemus asked. The question is not about its nature of the new birth or about the necessity of the new birth. Nicodemus understands that. He's hung up on, how is this even possible? How, is it, how does this even work? He recognizes it's, it's required. But he wants to know, how does this work? So starting in verse 9, we'll read through verse 16 of John 3. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, are you the teacher of Israel and do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and testify of what we have seen, and you do not accept our testimony. If I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven, but he who has descended from heaven, the Son of Man. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes will in him have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. He asked that question. How is this possible? How do these things be? Now Jesus has a little discussion there about, you know, if I, if I were to speak of everyday things, taxes and all that stuff, and you didn't believe me, well, how are you going to get these heavenly things? If you, if you fail to understand the earthly principles... How are you going to get the heavenly applications? But nevertheless, he, he continues on. He says about the Son of Man. 
He compares him himself to an event in Old Testament history recorded in the book of Numbers, chapter 21, 6 through 9. There, God sends fiery serpents upon the people as punishment. And some bite them. They're venomous. They're going to die. They repent of their sins and they ask God, we, we need, how, how are we going to remove this? So God tells Moses to fashion a bronze serpent. That ever, whoever looks intently upon the bronze serpent will be saved from that venom. There's similarities to the Son of Man. You know, the, the venom for us is sin. And just as Moses rose up the bronze serpent for, our, for their salvation, Jesus was lifted up on the cross for our salvation. That whoever would look to him as the source of their salvation would be saved. Now one writer marked the similarities between two of these two events. You know, in both instances, the serpent was the only cure for Israel. And Jesus was, is and was the only cure for our sins. There's only one cure offered. Not multiple. Not take your pick. There's only one. You know, you, you think about today, we have so many different names for ibuprofen. You get the generic kind, you can get Advil, Aleve, whatever. We, sometimes we think it's, sometimes we get picky about what brand we want because we think, well, the Aleve works better. You know, they say take two and last all day. But at the end of the day, it's all ibuprofen. It's all the same cure. It's what we're looking for. So we shouldn't expect God to be saying, well, we have different, you know, it's, it's one cure. Man cannot provide his own remedy. Now, man can't. Faith was necessary. It absolutely was. No one's going to deny that. No one's going to argue that point. And faith had to do something. You know, if I'm bit with that fiery serpent and it happened in my tent, it says, yeah, yeah, I, 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 believe, I believe what Moses said about the bronze serpent, but I, I just, I don't think I have to go outside and look at it. You know? I believe, I believe that's the cure. And I, I believe that God, if he just, he, he knows my heart, I know I believe the bronze serpent, but I'm not going to go out there and look at it. No, faith takes the available evidence based on what God has said and acts upon it. Okay, I'm big. God said if I go outside and look at that thing, I'm going to be healed. I'm going to go look outside. I'm going to go outside and look at the thing. Another perhaps more humorous illustration to convey faith. Belief is I recognize parachutes exist. I believe they exist. I've even seen one. But I've never placed my faith in one. Because I haven't strapped it on and jumped out of a plane and pulled the cord. Until I've actually acted on the knowledge, I haven't placed my faith in it. So I haven't placed my faith, there's in the Old Testament example, on the bronze serpent, until I've actually acted upon that knowledge. Likewise with Jesus. You don't have saving faith unless you act upon that knowledge and do what he says. Have that attitude. All the Lord says, I will do. Another interesting point is the cure was accessible to all. No one was excluded from this cure. God didn't say, well, everyone but Benjamin gets the bronze serpent. You know, today, God's not saying, well, only certain people I've picked out from the beginning of time, they're the ones that get Jesus. No, the language here in the text is that whoever believes, whoever believes will be saved. I find that much more comforting in the scripture and more consistent with the God I know from the scriptures. The other thing is too, the cure is understandable. The language is clear. No one's confused about what God said about the bronze serpent. And no one should be confused about what the Bible teaches about salvation. No one should be confused what we talked about tonight about that new birth. Now the reason why I can jump all over the scriptures about this is because the scriptures are chock full of depictions and teaching and and explanations of what the new birth is. I'm not having to streamline an argument. It's just, quite frankly, if I close my eyes and flip anywhere in the New Testament, I'm pretty sure I'm going to land near a description of the new birth or I'm going to be talking about the new birth. It comes up that frequently, especially in the book of Acts. The reason why Jesus is going to be raised up, getting back to the context of John 3, and why he was raised up, is found that next verse. Now, if you get into some of the original language text studies, that really, this, this phrase, that this is the reason why 
Jesus will be raised up. This is what it's saying. That four there is, here's why Jesus is going to be the, it's going to go through this. Why he's going to be raised up like the bronze serpent. It's because of God's great love for his creation. It's because of this great love that he offered his only begotten son. That whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have eternal life. You know, I think about back to Abraham. You know, God did what Abraham could not have done. God did offer his son upon the altar, and God did make that sacrifice. God stayed Abraham's hand at the last moment. But God made the ultimate sacrifice. He did it on our behalf. When we did not yet seek it, he offered it. So that all who would come to him would have access to that forgiveness. Now what should our response be to such things, to these things? You know, I think John the Baptist gives a good explanation here of what a belief is, and the Bible itself gives a good explanation of what this belief is talking about here. It's one of the things I love about the Bible. It's one of the things, many things I love about the Bible is if you just keep reading, the Bible it's its own best commentary, and the Bible will explain things as you keep pushing on. So you might be wondering, well, what, what actually is biblical belief then? And you might keep on reading on, and we see in John 17, he continues to explain about why God gave the Son and what the Son's job is. And we, now we're in time on John the Baptist and his last testimony. But you look at the end of the, end of the chapter. Uh, it's interesting that John the Baptist is now talking about Jesus. It says in verse 36 of John 3, he who believes in the Son has eternal life. There's that same language. But he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides in him. That word obey there in verse 36, same word for believe. Translators go back and forth. Because both are equally valid translations. Biblical belief in, includes within it the obedience to God's commands. This is not legalism. This is not trying to be rule keepers. This is simply what Jesus said later in in the book of John. I believe it's in the 14th chapter. John chapter 14. Verse 15. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. You know, you'll keep my commandments. You know what? How do we show love and appreciation for each other in our relationships with our family members, with friends? We honor and respect their wishes. It shows that we've listened. We have care and concern for them. Um, I'm not thinking of a humorous illustration right now in the moment, but I'll make one up. You know, siblings, I have two of them. We, we show a lack of concern when we don't, when you're in a car ride, and your one brother or sister said, quit touching me. And we keep on touching them. We've shown a complete lack of care and concern for our brother, our brother and our sister. But if we keep doing, if we do that, they say, quit touching me. They're like, okay, I'm going to stop. We've shown our care and concern. We've shown our love for them. If Jesus gave us instructions, it's not because he wants us to have busy work. It's for our benefit. It's for our good. The Bible was given for our benefit. So if Jesus said, and he did, in Mark 16, verse 16, that the one who believes in me and is baptized shall be saved, but the one who does not believe, they shall not be saved. I don't know how to make it any more clear. I've wrestled with that. I've tried to go around that. I've thought through that. Every time I hear a new argument, I, I study through it. But at the end of the day, Jesus said it. Now the question is, do I believe it? And if I believe it, am I going to obey it? We would love nothing more to assist you tonight if you've never experienced in the new birth. That can happen tonight. Uh, maybe you've never done what that Bi the Bible teaches for salvation. We would love nothing more to sit with you, talk with you, study with you. Um, if you have need for baptism tonight, there's water ready. Um, it'll be in the chino. It'll be nice and brisk and cold, but it'll be in the chino. You know, you'll, you'll experience a new birth. 
Uh, maybe even like you were firstborn, because you might come out screaming. It's, it's fine. Uh, it'll be fine. Somebody will be there with a blanket. But maybe you've done that in the past. Maybe you're struggling in sin. Maybe after being freed from the shackles of sin, you have found yourself entangled in that again. God says for his children who get involved in sin, come to him in prayer. Repent and keep on moving on. Keep on serving Christ. Maybe you're struggling. Maybe you just need encouragement to keep on walking the Christian path. If we can assist you tonight, would be if through baptism, prayers, or confession, whatever you need, please come forward as everybody stand and sing the song that's been selected.